Before we get officially started, let me just say a warm hello and welcome to everyone who's joining us. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm Kim Kuda Dring. I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at the Cummer Museum of Art and Gardens in Jacksonville, Florida. We are thrilled to be kicking off this first lecture, which is the first in a three-part series hosted by Cummer Beaches and generously sponsored by Dr. Diane Jacobson. Thank you so much, Diane. Uh, the title of this evening's talk is Black Subjects, Black Artists, Race, Representation, and Artistic Creation in the Cummer Collection. So before I introduce the speakers, and you've been hearing us chit chat a little bit as we were getting started, just a little <laughs> bit of virtual housekeeping. Um, we are recording and the recording of this talk will be available on the Cummer Museum YouTube channel in the coming weeks. So take a look at that. Also, we'd love to hear from you during the talk. So while attendees are not visible or audible um, during this live program, we do have the opportunity to submit questions. So feel free to drop some questions in the Q&A. We will monitor that. And um, when time allows, Andrea and Scott would be happy to answer those as well. Okay, so with that, let me introduce you to our speakers. Today we have Dr. Scott Brown, Professor of Art History at University of North Florida, Florida, or affectionately known as UNF, and Dr. Andrea Barnwell Brownlee, the George W. and Kathleen I. Gibbs Director and CEO of the Cummer Museum of Art and Gardens. Take it away, Andrea and Scott. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thank you all for, for being with us tonight. And sorry about my little technical glitch before we got started. So before we dive into the subject matter, I would just like to, to just share that I know that several of you on this Zoom tonight knew Mary Virginia Terry, who passed away on Saturday. And she was very, very special to the Cummer Museum of Art and Gardens. And I'm just very, very envious of those of you who had a chance to meet and to know her. So members of the Cummer Museum staff and our board, we're all in agreement that her generosity and her passion were really legendary. So we dedicate our conversation tonight and our time together tonight to her life and to her legacy. I also wanna mention that um, several champions of the Cummer Museum could not be with us this evening. They're actually participating in the candlelight vigil in James Weldon Johnson Park. And I want you all to know that we stand in solidarity with our partners at the University of Florida's One Jacks Institute, who have organized this very, very important gathering. We want to underscore that the Cummer Museum does not tolerate any type of hate, any type of anti-Semitism or any racial discrimination. And we are certainly standing with our colleagues there this evening. And, you know, we have so many just exciting things to share with you all, but I just want to start off by saying to everyone on this call that you all know that Dr. Scott Brown is just what we describe as a rock star, and I'm really pleased to be in conversation and in community with him tonight. So <clears throat> I'm losing my voice, but I'm very, very excited to be with you all tonight. So what do you think, Scott? Shall we get started? Yeah, let's get started. I am so pleased to be here with you. Uh, I've had uh, the opportunity over the last couple of years, uh, or it seems like almost two years, to get to know Andre a little bit. And uh, this is something I've wanted to do since the day you first landed in town. You know, there's nothing better than uh, talking about works in a gallery. And what I'd like to do next is actually go down and 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 do this on site. It looks like I'm in the cover tonight, but <laughs> <laughs> but this is just a backdrop, folks. Uh, but someday uh, soon, maybe we can all do something like this together. I'd love that. I really, really love that. Well, you know, in terms of us getting together for the very first time, I think we're both in agreement that portrait of a youth in an embroidered vest, <clears throat> excuse me, by Marie Vic by Marie Victoire Lamont is one of the most celebrated, most requested and discussed works in the Cummer Museum's collection. Um, so many people ask for it, they ask about it, and it would not surprise anyone that we wanted to begin our conversation um, with this particular work that has been the subject of really considerable intrigue. Um, I must tell you all that um, Holly Karras and I, Holly, of course, is the Jay Wayne and Dolores Bar Weaver Chief Curator, and we spend a lot of time talking about works in general, but this work specifically because of its intrigue. And what we were sharing um, in our most recent conversations about it is that, you know, scholars 
don't even agree about who painted it. They don't agree on this really, really important fact of who is actually um, the author of this incredible, incredible painting. Several authors, uh, scholars and authors, they discuss the fact that, no, first of all, it's not even by, it's not her, by her. It's by Jacques-Antoine-Marie Lemoyne. And um, they just absolutely are, are, are staunch believers in the fact that it couldn't be by her. And secondly, that the identity of the sitter is actually grounds for question. And, you know, they also believe that it couldn't have been um, an African, an African boy. They said, no, wait a minute. Some people really believe that he was brought to France from Bengal by an English captain and that it couldn't therefore be um, Zamora. And so they don't agree on the subject. He couldn't be Bengalese. He, if he was Bengalese, he wouldn't have had these Negroid features. I mean, 1996 was an incredible year in terms of this argument around the subject. Um, and this authorship, as I mentioned, was really quite contested. And so um, other people believe that since they were the, both uh, artists, Renee Lemoine, that you can see why it was misattributed on a regular basis. So after considering a host of arguments, the museum concluded that the most accurate title is actually Portrait of a Youth in an Embroidered Vest, and it is indeed attributed to Marie Victoire Lemoine. So um, one of the, the most exciting things that's actually happening right now, and if you want to go to the next slide, one of the most exciting things that's happening is the opportunity to pair this work, excuse me, um, by the artist Titus Kafar. And this is an exhibition that Holly has organized entitled Revolve Spotlight on the Permanent Collection, and it's on view through November 13th. So the opportunity to see these two works together is really, really quite quite tremendous. And so one of the things that we've been, been focusing on is just race and representation in general. You see this incredible um, thickly impostoed tar in terms of, of uh, portrait of Billy Lee and Billy Lee's face. Um, this is um, a painting that Scott, you and I have had an opportunity to, to chat a bit about. Would you like to 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 continue our our conversation with the intrigue with Titus Kafar? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Thank you. This is these two works are in such an interesting conversation, uh, and it's really the inspiration for our conversation tonight. I love the the Revolve exhibition because it puts works in uh, relationship to each other and and creates this conversation across time. Uh, uh, when we talk about some of the themes and some of the the appropriations uh, from the present, uh, from the past by the present, uh, this is a work that really uh, speaks to both of those those ideas. The um, uh, Titus Kafar's work is uh, fabulous in in a couple of ways that it connects to the themes that you brought up about Lemoine's picture. Some of the controversies over that work have to do with the fact simply that. Uh, the lives and the works of women and minorities in, in 18th century France were not well documented. Their lives were simply not recorded in the same way. Uh, Marie Victoire Lemoine, who was one of the few professional women painters and lived her entire life independently, never married. Uh, and, and But one of the reasons she is less well known today is simply because she was a woman. And this question of the identity of the sitter is so fascinating to me uh, uh, that he could be a Bengali or that he might be uh, uh, two of the other possibilities are, uh, uh, that have been suggested is that he's a, an African uh, a, a person of African origin named Scipio or Narcisse which I love these names. They're both uh, Narcissus, the, the, the mythological hero of beauty and uh, uh, Scipio, who was a great ancient general who was tremendously wise. Uh, I love that he, these names attribute a kind of identity potentially to the sitter, but we actually know nothing about the person himself. Nothing. And Titus Gaffar's image plays on that uh, with the idea of tar here erasing the image of the face. It is a, a visual erasure which echoes 
uh, in a kind of modern way, this historical erasure of memory and identity uh, that, that afflicts this work, which we have to call portrait of a youth because we don't have any more secure notion of it. You know, one thing I wanted to ask you, Andrea, is about the tar itself, because for me, I love the texture. Yes. It, every time I see it, I want to touch it. <laughs> I know, I know. And the rest of the painting feels so flat. What do you think that adds to the, the, the picture in terms of the tactility or the yeah. tangibility of presence of tar? The contrast between the two of them, and I know we have another um, another image with the two of them um, a few slides later that actually has them side by side. And when you talk about the flatness of um, the the moment, and then you compare it to this space, which is glistening and capturing light in so many different ways, and thinking about this idea that he was looking, he, Titus, was actually looking at this painting for that type of contrast that you described, that real, um, unbelievably thickly impostoed, run your fingers down it if you could type of image, switching the palette certainly, but playing with this background as well, putting it in a very, very um, sort of um, mysterious, almost uh, almost haunting background with these with this skyscape that is behind him. But I love what he says. I love what Titus says about our painting. He says, this portrait is one of my absolute favorite representations of a Black person from its period. I've always found it to be incredibly inspirational. It is one of those rare images where the sitter is not portrayed as a caricature. So he goes on to talk about being, um, you know, a proud, a proud sitter. So when you talk about the, this surface texture that you, you mentioned of this tar, it all plays into this idea that um, it's juxtaposed against this very, very flat uh, background. So these two together, again, just until next Sunday, it's just been an unbelievable treat to spend so many months with these side by side. Absolutely an incredible, incredible treat. But it also goes, you know, to underscore that these artists are, are so engaged with this history of art that you and I are just so passionate about. They're very, very um, compelled there in conversation, not only with other contemporary artists, but certainly with the, with the artists that preceded them. Yeah. So, and our, our, our picture has such an interesting history. Uh, I know you want to talk about its fascinating journey to the comer. Absolutely. I mean, again, Holly and I have regular conversations just about everything from provenance to um, surface texture to um, just the the um, the fascinating route that um, works works take before they get here. But we were talking about this um, this film. That is a it's about, a, it's about a 120 minutes or so, but it's a black and white biography of a French priest and a diplomat. And it was written by Sasha Guillotry, who is a, a French film, a French filmmaker. And it really does sketch this this life of this very, very complicated um, uh, antagonist and, and protagonist. And he's a, a politician and he's also this um, un unbelievable womanizer. And so in the middle of this film, you see this still with Arlemont in the background. And it just kind of brings up, well, what is the provenance of this particular work? How in the world was it on this set <laughs> with, with, um, with this very, very strange and unbelievable history? And so that does indeed lead us to a longer conversation about the provenance. And so um, the filmmaker actually acquired it from um, his father, and then it was sold to... Um, a, a French auction house, and then it was sold to another private owner, and then we acquired it actually, and you know, in in ninety six, and so. Again, this sort of history, the lives that these paintings have is always this very, very fascinating thing that art historians love to 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 geek to geek about. And I talked to Holly the other day about what does the back of this painting look like because it was acquired before 
we actually, I mean, before I actually came on board almost two years ago. And so the backs of the paintings are often very, very interesting. And so um, I, I often want to know those types of things because provenance is just such a really intoxicating um, component of, of, our, of our work and how the, the journeys how the journeys play out is something that I'm very, very passionate about. So um, again, this is one of those paintings that continues to intrigue. And I know that we've got some other works to get to, but this just really underscores that kicking it, kicking off our conversation with this is uh, very exciting and very enticing. But there's another pairing I know that we wanted to actually talk about, um, which was the artists themselves. Do you want to share a bit about artists and representation? Yeah, I actually, one of the things I, I am interested in as a scholar is artist self-representations. They're so revealing because, of course, it's the artist's opportunity not just to control the image that we see in the museum, but to control their own relationship to the image in our view. Uh, so on the left, we have uh, a self-portrait by uh, Jean, uh, by Marie Victoire Lemoine, and it's her in her studio with a student as well, which is really interesting. And of course, we notice that they're both women because Marie Victoire Lemoine worked any time before she could work in public as a woman. She wasn't allowed to exhibit in the salons until after the French Revolution. She spent most of her career actually having to work in private, which is probably how our painting was made. That is, a woman probably came to her, another woman, and asked her to paint a picture of a person in her household, our mysterious sitter. And those kinds of uh, woman to woman transactions are about the only way that you could be an artist as a woman in, in Lemoine's day. In fact, uh, she, the only male subject that she ever represented, to my knowledge, was our, uh, our subject. So here she is in her studio, but now she's in control because the studio is your place. And uh, you can see the picture on the wall over here that she's working on is barely sketched out, but it represents another subject of women in conversation. There's a devotee in prayer and the Virgin Mary is, is standing over her and they're addressing a religious image of a woman. Uh, and so I love this dialogue of women making images, copying images, adoring images. I think the fact that this is an artist making an image about a woman adoring an image is a really fascinating conversation. And then Titus Kafar, uh, in, you know, in ways that we can really strongly compare, of course, has also his works in progress in the studio. And he uh, addresses the viewer even more directly than uh, uh, Marie Victoire Lemoine. I wonder what you think about that in terms of his his addressing himself as artist to the viewer. Absolutely, and then of course when we consider the fact that this was um, just right after he was named a genius by the MacArthur Foundation, and this idea that he is using um, gilded works and looking at these subjects. And we're talking about really who's, who's worthy of being the subject of a portrait. Yeah. And so what he decides to surround himself in terms of in his studio is also very, very fascinating to me, um, knowing um, his evolution and knowing his incredible, incredible regard for history painting and for portraiture. It's very, very deliberate. And in both of these instances, there are no accidents, you know, very, very unapologetically confronting um, all of the things that they're passionate about and that they've demonstrated in their work. And so I love this particular pairing, um, very different approaches, very different studios, but equally as, um, as, as just passionate about what they what they represent, and what they stand for. And so I love this pairing um, to talk about artists and their self-representation, representations of them for, for many, many moons. I think your point that the gilding uh, is, so, is so important because it establishes Titus's images as uh, in reference to religious imagery. So in some sense, both of our artists have taken uh, subjects which have spiritual connotations. Uh, as self-representational. I just think that's really powerful. Yeah, and also this sort of moment where he's like, I'm not going to think about a tondo. I'm really going to think about something that is not traditional, but also very, very um, intriguing and very much on par with the history paintings and the portraits that he's been so, so compelled by. So again, really do love this particular pairing of these two artists in terms of self-representation. 
And speaking of, of pairings, of course, uh, Titus's work is also in dialogue with, with the companion image, uh, uh, Billy Lee and Oni Judge, who were both um, uh, enslaved people in the household of George Washington, uh, a man and a woman. Uh, I wonder if you, uh, you know, want to comment about that relationship. You know, seeing these two together, um, I had the opportunity to do it on, on several occasions, but seeing these two together was um, a real experience. And I describe it as an experience because in both instances, we did not have images um, at that time uh, of them. And so knowing her history of being um, an, an escaped enslaved person and um, evading captive for so long and going to Philadelphia and going north and making sure that um, she was she was she was never captured again and um, the Mount Vernon estate George Washington's estate put out several several calls to to bring her back and she always managed to evade um, of captivity and so the fact that he Titus has um, made it so that her face is also evading a real gaze was a very strategic decision and very, very sophisticated in that way. So these two, these two together um, about, again, who um, who could be seen. And I love the fact that it was actually in an exhibition entitled Unseen, Our mm. Past in, in New Light, Titus Kafar and Ken Gonzalez Day. So um, in both of these instances, the Lemoin and the Kafar, this real focused, again, unapologetic, um, way of examining examining these these subjects, these particularly black subjects, and so again, very very privileged to to see and experience these works in person. And again, just so thrilled that he um, Titus looked at our collection as a real inspiration for this very very complicated um, circle and cycle of, of of depiction and of rendering. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, when we look at our collection, uh, if we think like Titus, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that may uh, cause us to uh, to ask questions that may surprise us because we uh, uh, we didn't know they were there. Uh, and one, one of them that I love and I actually get a lot of questions about from my students and other people when I go to the museum is this image of a subject which is uh, more or less sort of familiar to a lot of us. It's the story of the three magi. The wise men, the Christmas story, where the three magi come and bring gifts, and I have a lot of people ask me, uh, "Well, uh, why is one of the magi black?" And and uh, because it's not a commonly known uh, fact that throughout the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, in fact, uh, uh, the three magi were considered to be three different races. Uh, and so uh, the uh, Balthazar, Melchior, and and Caspar. Uh, are the names that we give to the three magi. They're not in the Bible, but they arose long after the fact. And uh, Balthazar is the uh, African uh, uh, magi. So uh, I just will, will share, this reflects the idea of the globe, essentially. The world as it was known in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance was a world uh, divided into three parts. We see a, a famous image uh, of Christ as the Salvator Mundi, the, the savior of the world. And he holds the world in his hand. You can see the world has a nice big hemisphere across the middle, and then a little line across the top that doesn't go to the bottom. It creates the world into three parts. And they are Europe, Asia, and on the bottom, the largest part, Africa. Uh, so in fact, that image of the uh, wise man visiting and the Christmas tale is a story of the whole world coming to this place, which in, in the Renaissance thinking of the 16th century when this painting was made is a way of thinking that the whole world owes uh, uh, its loyalty to the Christian church. In some ways, that's a really provocative uh, statement, a lot of ways, I should think, because it represents a worldview in which there is a, a center of the world, a most important place in the world. And, and I wonder if, if you think, um, uh, uh, you, you know, how you reflect on that, uh, that narrative and that idea, that way of thinking about the world, placing ourselves oftentimes at the center, especially when we make representations like these. 
the, um, we can compare that as well to the mycin, which is a really fascinating example. So we have here these porcelain wares, which are, are literally uh, uh, um, originate in another part of the world. Uh, the discovery of porcelain, I know, is, a, is an interesting part of the Cummers uh, narrative because we have one of the most extraordinary collections of mice and porcelain. And uh, I, I wonder if you could tell us uh, maybe just a little bit about uh, that story of the, the discovery of porcelain, which is a part of our exhibition down at the Cummer. And I wanna invite everybody the next time you're at the museum to go through that room, which is so, so interesting. You know, I'm glad that you mentioned sort of the, the conversation with um, Revolve, which again is only up for another uh, week or 10 days, but the, the incredible foresight that our curatorial team had to not only bring in sort of contempor contemporary discussion about porcelain. I have to tell you when our the, your, your, your students from UNF came um, about, about two weeks ago with Dr. Murphy's class, we just had an amazing time talking about dialogue and how the Meissen collection being in conversation with works that are currently on view um, with Revolve was very, very special. And so the Yusuf Young piece that is now on view um, as part of that collection or part of that exhibition has prompted a lot of intrigue and conversations because literally right across the Uvalosia, you can go from that piece and experience our entire extensive Mycin collection um, is um, a very, very special experience. And we've also been talking about time travel and how these objects allow us to literally from gallery to gallery experience whole world cultures. And you were just talking about, you know, the adoration and this idea that people from totally different experiences could come together and um, I can't tell you how magnificent it has been to see people um, not only talking about these works, but talking about them together with strangers and mm -hmm. talking about the things that have um, have united them. And it's really great when you see uh, different people coming together. They didn't come together to the museum, but they actually end up having a long conversation about works that that intrigue them. But that's the beauty of what we're really trying to achieve at the Cummer, right. this idea of togetherness and exploring different cultures, different backgrounds, different mediums, and, and all of these things. And so this is just one example of, of how that idea of coming together has really come to fruition. And we're just very, very proud that objects are uniting us in these very important um, conversations. So yeah. very excited about the, that. The image on this plate uh, has long intrigued me uh, <laughs> because it uh, it represents the story of Marco Polo, which you know a lot of us know the name Marco Polo, but uh, he's not a historical figure that we that we talk very much about anymore. Uh, but it's an interesting image to me because we have this, this uh, type of object, which again, talking about the way objects connect us and unite us, uh, porcelain in China uh, was, uh, uh, was imported for many centuries before the Europeans learned the secret of how to make porcelain. And, and then there's this attempt here to, in this European produced porcelain, to lay claim in some ways to uh, uh, to the uh, to the story of porcelain, uh, what we have is Marco Polo, one of the first travelers to Asia in uh, uh, the Middle Ages, and he's presenting a map of the world to the Khan, uh, to uh, the the leader of the 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 Chinese and and Asian world, and he's showing the Khan where his country is located on the map. To me, it's such a funny and a presumptuous idea. Um, you know. <laughs> yeah, of, of telling the king, uh, here's the map that I made of the world, and I'm going to show you which part of it you're you have. <laughs> uh, but the rest of it is, you know, by implication, ours. And uh, but what's fascinating is that we have here again, just as in the Magi, three races. There are Asian, European and again, African figures present. And I think the presence of that African figure, uh, uh, like the Asian and the, the European Marco Polo, is just to make this, again, this geographic claim about the world. And again, placing Europe in many ways at the center of it. I, I think so much of European Renaissance art is about that, is about placing Europe at the heart of, uh, of, a, of a history. 
Uh, and that really fascinates me when we talk about um, a, a work like this in our collection, which it might seem like a big jump to move from China porcelain to uh, Mildred Thompson, but this is one of my favorite works in our collection. And what I love about it is that it's also a kind of mapping like the previous images that we've seen, but not a mapping of our place in this little pocket of the universe. It's a kind of cosmic map. You know, I love the idea of magnetism, which is part of this, the title and the concept of this work. But Mildred, who is so interested in, in physics and astronomy and a mathematics of space, which feels like music in our eyes, uh, to me, this is a way of exploding the boundaries we draw on maps. I wonder what you think about that in terms of this image as an image that is also in a way though about mapping. Yeah, I'm so glad that you used the word um, exploding because many of the things that Mildred Thompson stood for were about shattering ideas and shattering perceptions. Um, many people sort of took her to task because they thought that if she wasn't creating work that was representational and had black subjects, that you know the work really, really didn't qualify as African-American art or wasn't what she should be doing. And as we, we know, she spent so much of her time in Europe and didn't think Think about boundaries. She didn't think about this idea that she had to be bound to this one specific space or this one specific idea. And so when you mentioned this explosion and um, this uh, refusal, this absolute refu refusal to, to be contained, and that's what really this atmosphere is, is about, that she continues to explore throughout the majority of her career. It didn't matter if it was the, the wood sculptures that she created, which she called her wood paintings. It didn't matter if it was these really abstract works that um, defied gravity in many respects. Um, there's no question that this is another one of the most celebrated works in our collection. And I love to actually see it behind you tonight, but um, but I love the fact that um, this is one of those works that people want to revisit again and again, and this idea of a magnetic field in physics and mathematics, not to mention music, were um, the things that she was very passionate about and explored throughout her career. I've had the good fortune of working with several of her students and organizing exhibitions whereby she was the subject, and, you know, Melissa Messina, who's actually um, really responsible for the estate and I have had the wonderful, wonderful opportunity to look through her syllabi and all of her books and think about how she taught and how she really groomed her students to think in the same sort of expansive ways. And so when we organized an exhibition of, of her work, it became very, very clear that everyone had the same sort of um, response and reflection of her. It was limitless. And mm. that's really what her paintings do underscore, this idea of infinity, truly yeah. infinity. I, I so love this work. This is what the universe looks like to me when I close my eyes and open my mind. <laughs> yeah, she was, she was um, astounding to say the least, certainly a larger project on her work is is overdue, yeah. absolutely. There, I'm sorry, there's a Mildred, we should have had that up. Uh, right, right. And uh, I love to hear your conversations about this this ivory and this idea of skin and, and expectation and skin tone and beliefs, so. Yeah, this, this is one because of course I'm a, a medievalist by training. This is one I always uh, go to in the museum. It's uh, one because it's personal and we can't tell the size on the screen here, but you can see the dimensions perhaps. It is a, just a small little ivory panel. Yeah. And so it would have been part of a diptych, probably two panels that would have been hand handleable. So you can touch this. And that's part of the materiality of it is feeling the ivory itself. Uh, ivory, which is such a special and rare uh, uh, material and was so precious in the Middle Ages. But it's one that's fascinating to, to me for two reasons. One, this is carved in a European context. But of course, we can't talk about this object without talking about Africa. Because that's, of course, the only place that you get ivory here in Europe in the Middle Ages. And then uh, in, in tension with that and European perceptions of Africa throughout the Middle Ages and down into the present as 
uh, uh, as a, a, you know, a continent of dark skin, uh, to have this material which was pre treasured for its whiteness is to me such an interesting uh, contrast. Uh, and uh, so we have, likewise, I wanna point out, not only the appropriation of precious ivory, but the appropriation of a story itself. Uh, this is a story, the story of Christ and the nativity and of Christ's death, uh, which because it's Christian, we locate oftentimes in uh, European culture, but we have to remember it's a story about an African child. <laughs> I mean, Christ grew up in Egypt. <laughs> Uh, and so it's not just the material, but also the story, which is itself um, imported in many ways. And to me, it's an example of an artist in the Middle Ages in Europe, uh, taking from the past and taking from other places and cultures in very interesting ways that we can maybe compare to another work in the collection, which I just love, where we see an artist doing something similar borrowing, taking, appropriating, in somewhat the same way that Titus uh, borrows, uh, Titus Gaffar borrows from uh, Lemoine's painting. This is Bob Thompson. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what he's doing here. You know, Bob Thompson was one of the most intriguing artists who's, um, who I would argue, whose life was really really just getting started. Um, he made it a routine practice of looking at, at works in, in a similar way to Titus, now that I'm saying it out loud. Um, he, was, he made it a real point to look at, at classical painting and looking at several artists in, in new ways, but completely subverting and throwing out notions of skin color and notions of, of, of myth and ideas. And he wanted a different type of world. He wanted a world whereby um, expectation was completely thrown, was completely thrown out. Now in the four um, retrospectives that have been done on, on, his, on his life, I think that that is one of those things that has, we can explore more. We can continue to look at how he was, he was looking at um, a whole panoply of, of ideas around myth and expectation. And I just think he just, when we lost him, when he, when he took actually his, his life, um, we didn't even see the tip of the iceberg. We didn't even begin to scratch the surface of how he was um, debunking ideas of expectation in a very different way than than Mildred. You know, looking at myth and looking at at, at the tempest in ways that sort of divide our our expectations. And so, um, another one who we could spend a whole bunch of time. This is another favorite work in in our collection. So. Yeah, this is a marvelous work. And of course, it's it's based on a European uh, old master painting by the artist Giorgione, one of the great artists of the Renaissance, whose life is actually strangely, interestingly comparable to Bob Thompson's. He also died very young, and he's remembered for being uh, an extraordinarily passionate, driven uh, young man and artist who produced an enormous amount in a very brief time before he died. Interestingly enough, he's also known as a colorist, uh, uh, one of the great manipulators of color. Bob Thompson. The, in the <laughs> And uh, which is what Bob Thompson is, is particularly famous for, uh, his, his scintillating, intense, brilliant use of color, which is expressionist and, and just, um, just thrilling. Uh, this is a, a picture which I, I really do love, yeah. in part because it goes back to art history and it goes back and creates a conversation very intentionally uh, with the past. And here is Bob Thompson in his studio, mm -hmm. again, thinking of artists' self-representations. You know, one impression we get here is just how much work he's doing <laughs> when you're stacking canvases on top of each other against the wall. And he also is so serious looking. Always, he had that very much demeanor. Everyone that 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 knew him said that uh, his um, his approach to his work and his, it was very, <laughs> very, very serious on a, on a regular basis. This is is, is such an accurate um, self self presentation that um, there's no there's no denying that this is how he wanted to be remembered, how he wanted people to reflect reflect on him. So. Um, I know that, what time is it? Um, 
I know that we could, I just got the signal, it's 745. <clears throat> and we were supposed to definitely allow a few, a few questions. So um, I want to make sure that um, we definitely respond. And I'm noticing that some uh, have actually come into the chat as we speak, but I don't want to cut our, our conversation short, but wanted to make sure we keep ourselves honest in that way. Yeah, no, and and maybe we'll just uh, sort of end where we talked about uh, ending with uh, our great Augusta Savage uh, to take one more uh, example of the richness in our, our collection. Uh, this is a work that connects with the themes we were just talking about of, of materiality. And one of the things I love is when you cast something in bronze, you're giving it real value. And, and Augusta uh, Savage was a sculptor and preeminently a sculptor who worked and aspired to work in bronze. And, and the diving boy, which is such a treasure because it's one of the few surviving bronzes that she actually cast herself. And uh, I wonder if you could talk about that in terms of what it means to cast in bronze an anonymous little boy. Yeah, this idea of permanence, um, this idea that, um, you know, first of all, I should say that there are many things that we don't know about this particular work. We know, obviously, that it was um, in Nina Kummer's collection, and we know, of course, that there was a rapport between Nina Kummer and Augusta Savage, and we, of course, know about her relationship to the city and surrounding cities. But what I love about this conversation and conversations like this is it gives us an opportunity to ask people to help us as art historians, help us find the letters, for example, between Nina Kummer and, and Augusta Savage. We know that this came um, into her collection, but we want to know more. We really want to know more about their relationship. We know that she gave a talk at the Women's Club. Um, we know that at the, at the request of Nina Kummer, but we don't have a lot of details about how this incredible work in bronze you know, came to to our holdings. So, to your specifically about your your question about bronze and materiality. I mean, the fact that this was someone who was devoted to making sure that permanence mm -hmm. was um, a real focus of of her life, and how exciting for for Jacksonville that the harp is. Um, is a real focus of what's happening in terms of La Villa and Lift Every Voice and Sing Park. And, but this idea that you have something so enormous as this harp could be in the same sort of conversation in terms of its importance, in terms of its real staying power as Diving Boy, significantly yeah. different in scale, but just as important in terms of its materiality. This decision that she made to make sure that it was cast you know, that it was cast. So, you know, again, we could go on and on about this idea of permanence and her belief about not only her, herself as a, as a practicing artist, but teaching that. Augusta Savage was such an extraordinary teacher. And we've got so many people, so many artists that went on to talk about, you know, her, her influence. And of course, the Augusta Savage exhibition that Dr. Jeffrey Haynes um, organized and was the guest curator for at, at the Comer was just um, an extraordinary game changer, frankly, for the institution yeah. and Diving Boy, knowing that it was at the center of it is all that that more all the more dynamic. So this idea of permanence. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll say uh, by way of, of closing before we uh, turn to our questions. Yeah, yeah, another thing that I love about this work is that the, again the materiality of bronze, its permanence, its durability, but the vulnerability of the subject in this image of the youth, the boy, the nudity, uh, 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 the body uh, exposed in this way, which is which is vulnerable in the way that only, of course, uh, children can be. There's this tenderness uh, that is an interesting contrast with the, the solidity of the material and its, its eternal uh, uh, quality. Yeah. I, I love that. It makes the work so poignant to me. Yes. So we, are, we're, we knew we were biting off a lot. <laughs> <laughs> this talk, which just well, we, means we can do this again to talk I look about forward to that. Again. And like you said, in person, and we actually had to skip through some of the images knowing that we were uh, getting to the end of our time together. 
tonight. So um, I'm noticing some of the questions that are uh, in the in the chat, and we can perhaps try to dive into a few of them. Yeah. Um, let's see. And in just sort of reverse order, um, was this piece, the, the ivory uh, di diptych, originally painted, as far as you know? So no. Uh, now, a lot of times, sculpture would have been painted. You would paint limestone. You would even paint marble sculpture. But ivory would have been not painted just because of that preciousness of the material itself, which is what you want to come through. You want to feel the ivory, you want to see the ivory, uh, but uh, it's interesting, it's a good point to point out that almost all other kinds of sculpture were painted uh, during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. Right, and I'm glad that you mentioned the size of that work. Um, a few weeks ago, I was down there and just the intimacy of that very, very small work and the delicacy that just the real delicate nature of of that ivory again is something it, it it calls you to get close it calls you it makes you get close in order to truly truly experience it and then we can talk about bronze and we can talk about ivory and the distinctions between yeah. the two from a technical perspective a durability perspective but i'm so glad that you um wanted to include that work in our conversation tonight so yeah um let's see um Again, in no particular order, there's one question here. This is off topic, but since you mentioned wanting to touch the Titus Kafar piece, do you have any comments about climate activists damaging artwork to draw attention to their cause? And have you made changes at the comer in response? Sure. I could talk about this topic for a very long time because I believe that we do indeed need to be very, very um, cautious about what we're doing to the earth. There's no question that we in many, res many respects have not been responsible. Um, at the same time, I have been um, very, very disappointed in what is happening in terms of people, you know, super gluing themselves to um, works that we have all made a, a point to make a destination throughout our careers, throughout our lives, throughout our travels. Um, I understand and respect the fact that this cause is um, is um, paramount. It is urgent and it is important. However, I firmly disagree that um, going about making that point is to um, deface um, works of art in the in that conversation. And I think the argument is. Um, is a very is a very challenging one. We've got to find a way to to, to do better by Mother Earth, but I don't believe that defacing or destroying works of art is the way to do that. Um, in terms of changes that we've made in, in, at the Comer and Response, we have certainly made it a real point to not only um, inform our visitor experience um, associates as well as our um, as our security in terms of what we do, in terms of um, uh, responses to such things that we've been witnessing around the world and we've got to be vigilant and we've got to make certain that these works are are protected and that they're here for for the enjoyment while still making sure that the earth is getting the the respect and due diligence um, that it deserves and that frankly that it requires so um, the articles that come out almost daily these days are are shared and they're discussed regularly um, let's see, there's another question. Could you speak more about the use of tar to obscure the faces of the Kafar uh, portraits? Um, do you, would you like to take that or would you like me to? Sure, I, I'll, I, you know, I had a thought actually while yeah. you were uh, uh, speaking about the tar during our conversation, which maybe I'll just circle back to that. You know, one of the things that fascinates me about the use of tar is um, the materiality of it, which is sticky, <laughs> and, you know, and when I was a kid, I remember going to see the tar pits in, in Los Angeles yeah, right. and the fossils in the tar pits. And one of the things, the memories I have of tar is that it holds fast ancient things, that it is, it obscures, but it also preserves and, and it also uh uh, you know, uh, uh, locks in in a kind of, uh, not concrete, but tar, literally, uh, so memories of the past. So the surface, the fact that it's not flat, 
the wave-like uh, surface for me, it suggests the depth of the tar. And, and for me, I, I wonder to the extent to which Titus Gafar is thinking of this as a kind of tar pit of identity, not just covering up, but, but containing in its depths, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the fossils of, of a memory which has been lost in, in the case, for instance, of our portrait sitter, and, and to a large extent in the case of Billy Lee uh, himself, mm -hmm. just facts that were never written down, that weren't preserved, memories, that um, we may not recall, but that are lied under the surface. Um, I'm glad you mentioned surface because when we think about tar, we think about something very, very different. And it's certainly not thickly impostoed and it's not something that is um, uh, that has the same contour, the same shape and the same line, the shadows that are cast within the tar itself. Mm -hmm. When you get close to that work, I mean, it's just such an incredible piece. And you mentioned how sticky it is. The type of, of hand gestures and the, 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 the tools that he had to use in order to even build it up and then allow it the quick dry that yeah. it had. I mean, the weight of tar. I mean, it's, it's just a very, very sophisticated piece. So, um, you know, when he obscured the faces, not one facial feature is, is, is present. He made sure that there were, there were um, no typical contours in terms of what we think of as facial features. Mm -hmm. And this idea that we have no photographs of Billy, of, of Billy Lee, we have mm -hmm. no portrait, no photographs of that, of him, but he decided that he was going to invent what he could have looked like. I mean, it was a very, very sophisticated approach to portraiture. Yeah. And so again, this idea of using tar um, was quite, quite brilliant, really yeah. quite brilliant. Um, Let's see here. I am looking at a few more. I, I'm, I love the fact that so many questions are in there specifically about, about Titus and how did the, the museum borrow the Titus Kafar. So one of the conversations that Holly and I had when I first got here was this real desire to, to uh, pair these two works. And so um, I believe that, um, you know, an attempt had been made before to, to borrow the work and for whatever reasons it didn't happen. So I said, let's try it again. And so I, I reached out to um, a, a friend and certainly kept Holly attuned the whole, the whole way and was so thrilled that, you know, we were going to reunite, if you will, this painting in our collection with this work. So to make a very long story short, um, we asked a private collector they agreed to the loan and to the terms of the loan and were very, very generous to allow it to, to leave their, their home for, for many months. And so really, really privileged to present these two works side by side for so long. Um, let's see. Uh, another representation is a focus of scholars and audiences. How do you think museums will respond? Um, I have a few, few thoughts about that, but Scott, I'll let you respond first if you if you'd like yeah so uh, uh you know this is a, a an eternal and ongoing conversation and and one of the the the, the ways that we're responding I, I think just for example in our conversation tonight is to shine a light on uh the way that history museums like ours you know, not that we go back to the very beginning of art history in many ways in Egypt, and that we follow a, a line of art history as we've taught it for many years through the Italian Renaissance and, and the early modern period into the present. That's a kind of art history in a museum. One of the things that we can do just in our conversation, for, to, for example, tonight is to look at things that we've taken for granted in our collection that should raise for us more important questions about representation about histories which have not been told, but are just waiting to be told. But then the flip side of that, of course, is in our own present space, uh, making space for new artists and artists that have not been given their due. And, and I'll say Mildred Thompson is at the top of my list as an example uh, uh, of, of an artist who was literally, um, in, in many ways, just prevented from having a career in the United States, was very successful in Europe, uh, but told she couldn't do it here. Yeah. Uh, and I think we have a role now to go back 
and to um, not only to try to correct that recent historical record, but to make sure such things don't happen again. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that museums have a real uh, opportunity, not just a responsibility, but also um, an opportunity. Um, I also believe that uh, representation is something that we've been excited about and grappling with for a very long time through, throughout throughout um, our field, throughout the sector. And I think that museums are going to respond by continuing to find innovative ways to, to pair the permanent holdings with other key loans. We know as a field, we're certainly better together because no museum is comprehensive and has, you know, representations of, of every of every era and of every um, uh, representative of, of every era is probably the best way to say that. And so I think that it's going to force museums to be even more cooperative than they have been in the past, because we're interested in telling, you know, richer, fuller stories. We're interested in pairing works together on a regular basis and then animating them through programs, animating them through not only in-person conversations, but also virtual conversations like this, whereby we can bring people closer together and then hopefully encourage them to come experience the works in person at a time that's convenient for them. So I think museums are responding by, um, encouraging audiences to uh, come face to face and experience works in person in ways that we haven't before. We're using all the tools that we have in our toolkit to make sure that we do um, respond in ways that are responsible, that are hopefully welcoming, and that encourage people to get the word out to their, to their friends, associates, and families, et cetera. But I think museums have been very responsive and will continue to raise the bar. Yeah, um, maybe I'll look at one more. Let's see, did we get to all of them? Thank you, Kim, for um, listing some of the upcoming programs that are coming. Oh, there was another question. Uh, where was uh, Augusta Savage's studio when making um, the piece for Nina Kummer? Unfortunately, I don't, I don't know that answer. Scott, I'm not sure if, if you do, but um, there are so many, um, unknown. She was, of course, back and forth to New York, and you probably have heard about uh, Green Cove Springs and the new museum that was um, that opened recently in celebration of her legacy. But um, we don't know, frankly, enough about that piece. And of course, we know about the works that were destroyed that were by her hand, but. I genuinely don't know. Do you, by chance, Scott, have any other insights on where her studio might have been? No, I, I don't, mm -hmm. uh, you know, except that this was around the time that she was producing uh, the exhibition piece for the World's Fair. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one speculation or theory that I've that I've read about uh, that came, of course, during the Augusta Savage exhibition, that she um, uh, was making a swing when Nina Kummer acquired this piece. However, she acquired it. We don't know the details on this. But she was making a swing through Jacksonville, perhaps trying to find funding to cast her exhibition piece, which was in uh, uh, in uh, in clay, uh, to cast it in bronze, and that's the great harp, of course, which we're now uh, getting our own uh, modern casting of, um, and um, uh, not we the comer, but Jacksonville, right. uh, and lift every voice and sing, park, right. and um, so she was certainly working in New York at that time. Uh, but I, I don't know yeah. the details. Right. And we hope that conversations such as this invite additional questions and perhaps even reveal some answers to questions just like that. Because somebody knows, somebody knows, and we're hopeful that they will hear our cry and contribute to the conversation. So, well, I know that we've actually gone over our time, but I just want to thank you again for your time this evening and for being in conversation and for, you know, examining the works that we love so much in our in our holdings, our permanent holdings, and definitely want to twist your arm to do this in person um, and to keep to keep conversation going and to keep an open dialogue. So thank you. Thank you for saying yes. 
thank you uh, for the invitation. It was an honor and pleasure to contribute to this conversation. Thank you, Andrea. Right. Thank you to all of our, our attendees. Yes, absolutely. So to be continued, I look forward to that very much. <laughs> Great. We'll see you soon. Have a good one. Take care. Take care.